Here goes. Honorable Dr. Terence Michael Drew currently serves as the Prime Minister of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis, the political leader of the St. Kitts Nevis Labour Party, and the parliamentary representative for constituency number eight. He is a caring and a committed individual who has provided years of dedicated service as a medical practitioner specialized in the field of internal medicine. A community activist and a philanthropist by nature, Dr. Drew has been actively involved across his constituency providing dependable leadership on various community initiatives. The empowerment of youth and marginalized groups such as the disabled and elderly are especially his passion. He was educated at the Dean Glassford Primary School and went on to Bastyr Junior High and Bastyr Senior High Schools before graduating from the Clarence Fitzroy Bryant College in 1996. At 19, Dr. Drew was a part-time teacher at the Bastyr High School where he taught physics and mathematics. In 1998, he went to Cuba to study medicine where he graduated with first class honors from Institute Superior de Ciencias Medicas in Santa Clara, Cuba. Dr. Drew returned to St. Kitts and worked as a general practitioner at the Joseph N. France General Hospital and also from his private office. In 2010, Dr. Drew was awarded a full scholarship to pursue specialty study in internal medicine at the Paul Foster School of Medicine in Texas. He graduated in June 2013 as a member of the American College of Medicine and American Medical Association. He is now a diplomat of the American Board of Internal Medicine. From 2005 to 2006, Dr. Drew served as a medical intern at the Joseph N. France General Hospital and completed rotations in internal medicine, general surgery, pediatrics, obstetrics, and gynecology, emergency care, and community medicine. He also worked as a house officer from 2006 to 2007 and from 2007 to 2010. Dr. Drew was employed with the Ministry of Health as a district medical officer. Dr. Drew's transition into politics is a natural extension of his commitment to service and the well-being of the people of constituency number eight. With a clear vision of advancement and enhancement, Dr. Drew will continue to seek new opportunities for the development of the people of his constituency and the Federation as a whole. A community activist and a philanthropist by nature, Dr. Drew has been actively involved across his constituency, providing dependable leadership on various community initiatives. He actively participates in the community sports arena, helping young people in football and basketball keep active and healthy. The empowerment of youth and marginalized groups, such as the disabled and elderly, are especially his passion. Over the years, Dr. Drew has worked diligently to build a personal relationship with the people in his community and to help wherever possible. He has taken the time to listen to their needs and concerns, which led him to establish the CARE, C-A-R-E Foundation in February 2021, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that aims to aid citizens nationally across both islands of St. Kitts and Nevis. 
The motto of the St. Kitts Nevis Labour Party for the good that we can do is at the core of his political aspirations. Let us welcome Honorable Dr. Terence Drew. Let me take this opportunity to say that that was a long bio. I think we need to work on that one. <laughs> but I want to really thank the people of Montserrat for having me here. But before I get into that, let me of course recognize the protocol that was so ably established. And I say ably because I think she did an excellent job. Put your hands together for our chair person this morning. I want to recognize the premier of Mount Strat, and I also want to recognize my fellow colleagues who are here on the stage with me. But it would be remiss of me, as I started before, not to recognize Dr. Didacus, who is the head of the authority at this moment, and I can attest to his dedication. Many times we receive messages from him all hours of the day. Tells me that he works more than he sleeps. Thank you very much. I am grateful for the for you for affording me the opportunity to stand here before you today in my capacity as head of government of St. Kitts and Nevis after the historic victory of the St. Kitts and Nevis Labour Party at the polls on August 5th, 2022. Our party is the oldest active political party in the English-speaking Caribbean. We have completed 90 years this year. I am equally grateful to you and to the government and people of Mount Strat for the warm hospitality extended to me and the members of my delegation. I had the opportunity with my colleague PM Deacon to visit the volcano site yesterday. And as I looked at it, it reminded me and inspired in me a number of critical principles, one of which is the principle of resilience. It told me, it tells me, that the people of Montserrat, despite the challenging or the challenges that they face with that volcanic activity, as I saw the green shrubs trying to push their way from among the ash that covered them many years ago, I can see the spirit of demonstration penetrating and coming back to life and saying to us, we are here and we will excel. Thank you for that lesson. Mr. Chairman, it is indeed an honor to address this august body of leaders and the people of the OECS and this great island. We all share a strong commitment to regional integration, be it on the economic, social, or environmental de developmental fronts. Our regional integration is not only robust, but deep in substance and wide in scope, touching all the pillars of sustainable development. It is firmly rooted in the revised Treaty of Bastyr, my hometown, the revised Treaty of Chagaramas, and the 2030 Agenda of Sustainable Development at the level of the United Nations. My address today should not be considered against the backdrop of the myriad of challenges which confront leaders of our regions, Paramount among these are the economic fallout caused by COVID-19 pandemic, disruptions in global supply chains, leading to significant increases in the price of basic commodities, 
the clear and ever-present danger posed by climate change and closer to home, the crisis currently experienced by our brothers and sisters in Haiti. Mr. Chairman, it is imperative that we reflect on and consider practical solutions to the challenges that confront us. These challenges not only obscure our clear vision, but threaten to steer us from the path of achieving our targets enshrined in the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. We must never lose sight of our ethos, working to make a difference in the lives of the people whom we have the privilege to lead. Allow me to take you back to June 18, 1981, at the signing ceremony of the original Treaty of Basti. This modest yet significant event took place on the front steps of government headquarters Basti, the capital city of St. Kitts and Nevis, where seven representatives of governments of the WISA Council affirmed their commitment to the birth of a new regional organization, the Organization of the Eastern Caribbean States. The mandate of the OECS was, among other things, one, to promote cooperation among its members, two, to promote unity and solidarity among its member states and defend their sovereignty, territorial integrity, and independence. Three, to seek to achieve the fullest possible harmonization of foreign policy among the member states, to seek to adopt as far as possible common positions on international issues and to establish and maintain wherever possible arrangements for joint overseas representation and or common services. Four, to promote economic integration among the member states through the provisions of the agreement establishing the Eastern Caribbean common market. 20 years later, the OECS evolved into an economic union, thereby deepening the level of integration incorporating the free movement of all nationals of the member states who signed the protocol. This improved iteration of the OECS is embodied in the revised, revised Treaty of Basti. Mr. Chairman, my invitation, to us, my invitation to us to take a walk down memory lane was not intended to evoke feelings of nostalgia or to pat ourselves on our backs for the strides we have taken along this fearless path of regional integration. I would rather invite us to explore the possibilities of expanding the scope of our movement. I am encouraged by the body of work that has been taken by the OECS Commission and the individual member states to take the process forward by implementing the provisions of the revised Treaty of Bastille. Decisions to be taken at the very meeting of the authority on the portability of social security benefits, contingent rights policy implementation, capacity building for officials, and the finalization of an OECS unique identification card are steps in the right direction. We should leave this meeting with a deeper level of commitment to our cause. Mr. Chairman, one of the hallmark features of the OECS has been the establishment of joint overseas representation and all common services. Today, we have joint embassies in Brussels, Belgium, Rabat, Morocco, and a technical mission to the World Trade Organization, WTO, in Geneva, Switzerland. And I take this moment to salute our robotics team who is presently in Switzerland and doing very well among the teams of the world. I am convinced that we should build on this foundation and spread our diplomatic footprint on the African continent and further afield. We may wish to engage the African Union as they consider us the sixth region of Africa by, of course, considering observer status, 
giving us a seat at the table where matters related to trade, investment, and cultural cooperation are discussed. We may also wish to deepen our level of engagement by establishing a presence in major cities like Abuja, in Nigeria, Accra, in Ghana, and Cape Town, South Africa. The possibilities are endless. We have started the discussions with the Afrexim Bank, which was alluded to earlier by one of my colleagues. And I urge us to take the subject of joint representation to a higher level and make the necessary decisions to enable us to reap the rewards to be derived from this increased level of engagement. It is difficult for us to achieve our development objectives if we ignore the challenges posed by the proverbial elephant in the room glaring gaps in our interregional transportation sector, as was referred to my colleague Deacon. An efficient and sustainable transportation system will yield benefits for investment, trade, and movement of people, two pillars of our regional integration movement. An important part of the discussion should also include a strategy for enhancing the viability and sustainability of our citizenship by investment programs. Many of our countries are dependent on the revenues generated by this program, but we must not be short-sighted or sell our countries short. We must be cognizant of the risks associated with devaluing our program and develop a united approach which will ensure the viability and continued success of the program for all of our member states who are involved and all of our citizens who benefit and will continue to benefit. My final statement relates to the need for us to take action to strengthen our regional institutions. These include, but are not limited to, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, whose headquarters is in my dear country, the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority, and the Eastern Caribbean Telecommunications Authority. Our actions at the individual member level must implement decisions taken by the respective councils and the authority. Failure to implement decisions serves to undermine the strong foundation of the OECS. We should also commit to providing the resources necessary for implementing these decisions. I wish, therefore, in this spirit, to reaffirm the commitment of my dear Federation St. Kitts and Nevis to strengthen our OECS economic union. Rest assured that I will do all in my power, along with my cabinet colleagues, to oversee the implementation of the decisions emanating from this meeting of the authority. Mr. Chairman, I thank you once more for affording me the opportunity. But before I go, I want to, of course, extend my sincerest sentiments with respect to what took place in Grenada in 1983 and to say to the people of Grenada that we in St. Kitts and Nevis, we continue to hurt with you, but we also continue to be hopeful because we are all a resilient people. And PM Deacon, please take my words to your people to let them know that we care and they have our support. I also want to say to that end that to the people of Haiti, I listened to that song last night, Haiti, I'm Sorry. That was sung so many years ago. And after so many years, we are back to the same place, and possibly even worse. That while we say we were sorry, a lot more could have been done. And in this vein, I encourage us to do what we can for our brothers and sisters in Haiti the first freed slave nation in the Western Hemisphere, setting the spirit of independence for all of our peoples who came here in shackled slavery. We must never forget 
their sacrifice and commitment to that spirit and therefore encourage us to do all we can to let our brothers and sisters in Haiti know that we are not only sorry, but really we want to do what our capacity allows us to do and extend a tangible hand. Thank you very much.